Oklahoma Gardening is a production of the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the land-grant mission of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University, dedicated to improving the quality of life of the citizens of Oklahoma through research-based information. Underwriting assistance for our program is provided by the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry, helping to keep Oklahoma green and growing. Today on Oklahoma Gardening, host Casey Hinches has a frilly flowered Oklahoma proven plant. David Hillock has some peppers picked to be all American selections. We follow the process of making honey from the hive to putting it in a bear shaped bottle. And Barbara Brown takes our honey and makes it even better by infusing it with herbs. discovered the spider flower it's definitely one that you need to add into your garden this is an Oklahoma proven annual and this particular one is Senorita Blanca now there's a couple of different cultivars or varieties that you can get and depending on which one you get they can range from anywhere from a three foot to a six foot height they come in a range of colors from pinks to whites to purples and what really sets the flower apart is the extra long stamens that they produce giving them those kind of long spider leg looks to them. It adds a nice little frill to it. Also the foliage has a palmate leaf to it. As you can see here it kind of looks like the palm of your hand which again adds a little texture to the plant itself. They're great for containers. You can use them as a thriller in a container or you can use them kind of like what we've done here as a temporary hedge because they are an annual so they're going to uh, die in the winter time. You can also use them in uh, mixed perennial beds which add a nice little texture or if you're looking for that cottage style look as well. You'll want to plant them in moist, well-drained soil and also in full sun. And usually you buy them in as a small four inch container and you're gonna have a big plant in no time. As you know, we've had a whole bunch of the AAS, the All America Selection Winter plants, planted out here in the gardens this year. And today I wanted to highlight the peppers that we have. We have some really great selections. I'm really impressed with them. They have done really well all year long, and they're really quite spectacular right now as we go into the fall. Um, the first one here, this is called Pretty and Sweet. You can see it's a nice compact plant, only reaching about 18 inches high, multi-colored fruit, um, and also supposed to be kind of uh, nice and sweet as well. It's, it's, so it's, it's really pretty, you know, makes a great ornamental plant, but it's also edible. And uh, someone uh, uh, through the, pro the selection process uh, gave it the term of an ornamentable. So a nice, I think a nice fitting name for this plant. Uh, the next one is a chili pie, um, th or the name of it's chili pie. This is a, a miniature bell pepper um, also a nice compact plant, only reaching about 18 inches high. Um, and the peppers um, will mature to a bright red. So a nice bright red miniature bell pepper. Um, also supposed to be, have a really nice flavor to it. The next one here is a Hungarian pepper, which I understand is supposed to be pretty hot. Um, but this one is supposed to have, is, is, is more semi-hot, and it's called Mexican Sunrise. The fruit on this are really attractive as well. They actually start out um, a lime green to yellow, uh, and then mature to an orange and then red, kind of mimicking the sunrise. Uh, so this one is also a nice compact plant, um, very prolific, has some great fruit, um, great flavor. It's supposed to be good for eating fresh, um, for pickling, as well as for processing. The next variety we have in our display is a cayenne pepper. This one's called red ember. You can see it also has, develops into some bright red fruits. And notice that the ends of the peppers are rounded instead of pointy like many of the cayenne peppers um, have. Um, it's also a nice compact plant. Um, balloon, or develops and matures early, so you can start much, uh, harvesting them early on in the season and they'll continue on into the fall. 
Um, they are set, said to have a, a semi-hot uh, uh, to sweet flavor to it. Um, and some people consider this one a little bit tastier than maybe some of the other Cayennes. Uh, this next one is called Escamillo. Um, this is a, um, a nice upright plant. Uh, the, the fruits are held up off of the ground so you don't have to worry about them rotting. Um, it has a nice golden yellow color. This was a 2016 winner. So again, another nice, all of them are really nice compact plants, so they work great in, um, you know, small space, in a container, um, et cetera. And then the last one here, this is the, uh, um, called Cornito Giallo, um, and it also has a nice bright yellow fruit on it, um, also nice, compact, um, and considered to have a great flavor. The last two uh, peppers I want to show you are actually uh, ornamental peppers. And I just love these plants. They are so fantastic. Um, I mean, look at how gorgeous they are. Uh, this one's called Black Hawk, and you can see it has black to red fruit on it, so very attractive, uh, which contrasts nicely against the dark green to uh, darker, almost black uh, leaves as well. Look how nice and compact this is. It only grows about six to 10 inches. And uh, again, it's just a really spectacular variety. And this last one here, this one's called Onyx Red. And look at how dark purple, almost black the leaves are. Uh, also contrasting really nicely with the bright shiny red fruits. Nice compact plant, very tidy, very neat, full of fruits, and another fantastic ornamental pepper. the Cimarron Valley Research Station and joining us today is Candy Vendesca who is a professional beekeeper and yes. Candy we've got a few hives that we've started here down in Perkins um, and we're gonna harvest honey today is that correct? What today we... is honey harvest day we're excited to look at them to see how much excess honey the girls have produced for us. Well I'm glad I wore the right attire for today. Absolutely. <laughs> so what's, the, what's the first thing that we need to do in order to find that honey? Okay the first thing we're gonna do is we'll take the lid the uh, lid off and we will check that super and see if it's drawn and if it's capped. And if it is, we will remove it. We will put um, my fume board on, which is has a repellent on there that the bees don't really like. It actually kind of smell. smells good to me. It smells yeah. really good to me. They have other that smells like vomit, but we don't use that <laughs> this one. This has kind of an almond smell to right. it. Right. So. so we'll put that on and that will gently drive the bees down. So we can take the frames out without having that many bees interfere with us. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I'll pull them out and then I'll use my brush to remove the remaining ones. All right, so, so. Let's, let's head over there. We wanna make sure we're staying behind the hive, is that correct? Absolutely, don't get in the girl's way. <laughs> and they're um, all females that we're working with, is that? Yes, <laughs> and we know how ladies are. Um, this, uh, wow. Got some good propolis. Look at the girls. Look at all those girls. Wow. And you see the sticky propolis? This, this, that's this. on my gloves and then also along the edges here? Absolutely. This is uh, propolis. It's what they seal the hive with. So it's kind of it like a wax? A, or? Kind of, only it has medicinal values. It's the antiseptic that uh, keeps their hive clean. This looks very, pro you can see. Can you see how yeah, sticky? Yeah, it's, how, it, it's glue. It is absolutely bee glue. So the girls are gonna come out and see us. All right, look at this. They have, they do have a frame of cap tunning. So it's not, not every frame is drawn, but what we're gonna do is we're gonna put that when you, you keep saying drawn, they're actually have made honeycombs on that. Is that correct? Right. Okay. Goodness. So. So you're basically prying each I'm of those honeycombs each frames loose, from the box. Okay. Right. Because they've got them uh, glued or, or yeah. stuck together. So you can see, can you see that most of the bees are gone? Uh -huh. Okay. I think they're flying around us. <laughs> well, they are. Most of them. So we have a few bees. And so I'm just going to brush them off. I'm just brushing the excess bees. You can see they haven't completely drawn the frame, but they've got most of it filled. Mm -hmm. It's a nice dark so, golden color. 
Okay. So will we be just harvesting out of this top box? We will. We will go at least these ne the next two. Okay. They have three boxes here that will be their winter stores. Okay. What they will eat. They're a medium box when it is full of honey is about 60 pounds. Wow. So that was plenty enough for me to have to um, carry. Okay, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to spray this, the bottom of the tray mm -hmm. with a little bit of this. That will move them out. So they, that's more of that human. <clears throat> more of that. Herb. And this is called a triangle escape. You can see it's like a maze. Uh -huh. See the bees are, they fly to the light and then they have to work to get out. Okay. They can't normally get in. Gotcha. So any bee that's left in the box now will come up. Oh, okay. So when we talk about harvesting honey, we're really just taking a percentage of what they have uh, made and they're going to survive off the rest of it. Right. We only take their excess. We make sure that they have enough left and bees, bees are constantly working. They are constantly searching out nectar. So any, any little hole that they have that they can fill, they're going to fill it. It doesn't matter how much they might have already. They just are constantly working. And then of course, depending on the season and the weather and where you might live, this happens maybe once or twice a year? Right. Okay. Uh, in Oklahoma, uh, I have been able to have two harvest before. In Kansas, we mainly just do one, but, but the, the nectar flow down here is so much better. Okay, so I'm going to do what I would call the boot test. See how I'm shaking that? Uh -huh. But none, no nectar came out. So even though it's not capped, this honey is, is right. Oh, okay. It is otherwise the right, it would come out because it would be too... It would be too wet, too much moisture in it still. But the water content is good. So the bees cap it themselves. How do they know when to cap it and when it's done they just <laughs> fill it up and then it's done or? no no they have to somehow they have to know the water content of that nectar and when it gets below 18 percent moisture content they will cap it and store it then um, they know it won't ferment okay the lid on and there is our there is one super that is harvested and now Lynn's gonna take this box off and it is, it is full as well. So we'll put the fume board on while we carry this to the truck. Candy, this has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for letting us help you. Oh, I'm so glad you came. <laughs> Wasn't it fun? It was, it was. And it's, it's interesting to learn about how smart bees are to do this and uh, great product that we get as well. Oh, they're fascinating creatures. I learn something new every day from them. Thank so, you. You're welcome. Started our honey at the Perkins Research Station. We are in the honey house with Candy Venduska. And Candy, you're going to show us what the next step is to get that honey out of the honeycomb. Absolutely. We brought the honey here from uh, Perkins. And the first thing we've got to do is we've got to uncap it. Okay. When the honey is uh, dried sufficiently, the bees will put these uh, cappings Which over it. Which is like it. a wax, right? Like a wax. And so you can see where I've moved it and you can see the honey. Sometimes they don't finish capping, but they've got the moisture content perfect. Somewhere around 17% is what the bees like, and the honey doesn't spoil okay. at that percent. So in order to get the honey out, we've got to uncap it. We've first. got to uncap it. So now another thing, if you remember, we use a permacomb, which is a fully drawn plastic frame. Makes uncapping super, super easy. So I use my handy dandy little tool once. twice 
So again, this permacomb is a plastic honeycomb, if you will. So they don't have to build a whole honeycomb thing. themselves. Right, but, right. But you can, as a beekeeper, just buy frames that they would have to build the honeycomb up on it. Yes. And now next, I just set it in uh, the uncapping tank. It, it will set in here until I get a full load. My extractor happens to hold 18 frames. Okay. So they'll, they'll set in here until I move them over. So what is this machine doing with this the caps machine, in the meantime? This machine here is just fantastic. It's uh, the uncapper. Uh -huh. And what it does is the, un the cappings go in here with, the, with a, usually a lot of honey, and it spins and it will come out, oh. the excess honey. So we are retrieving a lot of honey that would normally just get fed back to the bees. Gotcha, okay. So, okay, so now you put them in here. What's happening in this machine? All right, this is the holding tank where the, there's some honey that will drip out of these frames while it's waiting to get a full load okay. to go in the extractor. So you got another bucket under there collecting anything that drips out? It will okay. eventually, but now for right now, most of the honey is in the bottom of okay. the tank. Okay. So, so it's very, very important to balance your extractor uh, so that it doesn't wibble and wobble and mm. walk across the floor. So Candy, what exactly is this machine? Well, this is our extractor. Some people call it a centrifuge, but it's just an extractor. And this is an 18 frame radial, meaning that it will sling the honey out of both sides of the frame at, at the same time. We don't have to stop it, turn the frames and start it again. Oh, okay. So uh, we'll start it out slow and then we'll, we'll speed it up and we let it run 10 to 15 minutes. You can take a peek to see if we can see any, any more honey being slung out of it and then we will shut it off. Okay, and I should say it's fairly warm in your honey home and so that kind of helps pull it helps, some of that. It helps that honey uh, come out a lot faster than it would if it's cold All right. or cooler. All right, so yeah. let's fill it up then. All right. Are you ready to bottle up some of that delicious honey? Yeah, so we all put right. all the honey in here now. The honey is in here. Okay. Uh, we did lightly filter it to get the wax particles out. Um, so now uh, we're ready to bottle. So take your bear. Okay. And you'll place it under there and pull down on the lever. And how much do these bears hold? These bears hold 24 ounces. Okay. Uh, honey is sold by actual honey weight. It is not sold by volume. And so it's actually warm, still coming out. You can fill it on your We hand. have, uh, our bottler is water jacketed, so it heats the honey up to about 115 or so degrees. And that, that makes bottling a lot faster. Yeah. Especially with fall honey that is thick. It's so. flowing pretty well. Yep. All right, so there we've got our finished bottle. Very we good. just cap it, put the lid on, and it's ready to go find a new home. So a little bit about the color. This is a pretty dark <clears throat> honey. Can you tell that, us a that little That is, is a darker honey. The fall honeys are darker. So the okay. fall honey would be a darker honey because of the different flowers. Your spring honey is normally lighter, okay. and it would have a sweeter taste, whereas the fall honey has a more floral taste to it. Okay. Now, I think this is what most people think of when they think of honey, including the teddy bear bottle, but what about uh, spun honey? I've heard of things like that. Spun honey is a honey that has gone to sugar, but we control it, so it's real creamy and smooth. Uh, this is just a plain, and you can see just how creamy. I call it the dripless honey. Wow. So... So it's the honey just the same as this honey, just, just different form. Right. Nothing extra has been added. It's all pure honey, but it is a starter that we use, and those uh, sugar crystals grow at a really, really small, thin grain. All right. So. And what about some of the other products that you get out of harvesting the hives? Out of harvest what about the beeswax and stuff? Uh, we will take the cappings out of the capping spinner, and I will melt those down and form them into blocks I have a beeswax or I have different sizes for my different recipes if I want to make a lotion bar lip balm or soap you I have put different some fragrance oils in there and right stuff like that. different oils so or I will sell a lot of wax to other ladies that want to make or carpenters woodworkers um, oh. skateboarders even oh, so for it's their amazing boards and things. there's hundreds of uses for beeswax very nice 
So, Candy, this is a pretty elaborate setup, and I know a lot of people are getting into beekeeping. Do they need this sort of thing to harvest the honey? You don't really need anything as elaborate as this. Uh, it certainly helps. The more hives you have, mm -hmm. the, the faster it makes it. But you can do, you can start off with crush and strain, which is messy, and you waste a lot of comb. Or you could get a small hand crank extractor okay. and just use that. All right. So, yeah. And so, any last advice for somebody who might be interested in getting into this or who to connect with? Well, there are different classes uh, that are taught through local beekeeping associations. I do come down to Indian Meridian Votech. They're in Stillwater and I'll be teaching a class in February. But there's three or four um, different groups around the Oklahoma area that you can find and join. Excellent. It would be great. And, and of course they all give you good advice and they're very teamwork oriented, right? With yes, yes. They want to help everybody be successful. No pun intended. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> absolutely. Well here's to some success. We got some meat here. Yes, some of our homemade meat. It's wonderful. Excellent. So, Thank you. Thank you. have issues with infusing things in the home. Uh, one of them that we have negative issues with is, is infusing oil so that you uh, it put something in your vegetable oil uh, or your olive oil so you make it taste like garlic or pepper or whatever. And the issue with that is it's low acid and because it's low acid and it's oxygen free it can produce or allow to the growth of botulism toxin so it can cause poisoning later on. So we don't recommend doing that for any length of time uh, and definitely not for storage at room temperature. But people also want to infuse honey, and I have a more positive response to that one. Uh, because honey is acidic itself, uh, the botulism toxin will not grow in honey. Uh, the, the bacteria can't grow there, so we can infuse honey. So I'm going to show you how to do that. It's very, very simple, requires no processing or anything along that line. Uh, you just need a week or two for it to develop flavor. So I've got a standard canning jar for this one, but you don't have to have a standing canning jar. You can have any kind of jar as long as it has a tight fitting lid. So you could use a canning jar with a two piece lid uh, or one of the reusable lids, or you could just use uh, a, an old pickle jar that you've completely cleaned out or an old honey jar uh, that you completely cleaned out. So uh, as long as it's clean and the lid fits snug, uh, you're good to go. Uh, so very simple here. I'm gonna put uh, two to three sprigs of some sort of an herb in here. And I'm using rosemary, but you could use real common ones are, are thyme and uh, sage as well. So uh, there are lots of others that, that people use. And then you pour, after you clean your uh, jar really well, uh, you pour about two cups of honey into it and put the lid on. You're gonna wanna push that honey down a little bit uh, to make sure it st stays submerged. And then you're going to store it on your shelf until uh, probably five to seven days. You can check the temperature, see how much has, has actually come out of it. Uh, and this is, is ready to go for, into storage for, for that period of time. Now, once that time period has gone by uh, and it's developed the amount of flavor you want, either, uh, again, five to seven days, two weeks, somewhere in that area. Some things like uh, vanilla pods take a little bit longer uh, for that flavor to transfer uh, than some of the herbs do. You don't want to leave that in there. It's not going to help it in any, in, in any case anymore. So you get another jar. And here you can use some of those pretty jars that people always want to do canning in uh, that we don't recommend because we recommend a standing canning jar and standard lid. Uh, use some sort of a strainer uh, like this works fine. Uh, and put this over the, the mouth of that other jar that you've cleaned well and just transfer it in and, and strain the herb or whatever it is you're adding the, the infusion with out. Again, cover it with a nice snug lid, put it in a cool, dry place. And this is gonna last you for a long time because honey does not really break down. It may crystallize and you can uh, soften it up again through a little bit of heat. Um, but uh, this one, no processing, good flavor, great on baked goods. Uh, and in, in baked goods as well, you can use it as a replacement for sugar up to a certain point in many cases. So I hope you'll give this a try. It's easy, could make a great gift for the holidays. For Oklahoma Gardening, I'm Barbara Brown.
There are lots of great horticultural events this time of year. Be sure and consider these activities when you're making your plans for the weeks ahead. Next week, Casey will have another Oklahoma proven plant. We'll visit a beautiful home garden in Blanchard, Oklahoma. OSU vegetable horticulture specialist Lynn Brandenberger will plant fall cover crops and will meet an undergraduate student conducting research at Oklahoma State University. We hope you join us in for more TV you'll grow to love. To find out more information about show topics, as well as recipes, videos, articles, fact sheets, and other resources, including a directory of local extension offices, be sure and visit our website, oklamagarding.okstate.edu. And we always have great information, answers to questions, photos, and gardening discussions on your favorite social media as well. Join in on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can find this entire show and other recent shows, as well as individual segments on our Oklahoma Gardening YouTube channel. And tune in to our OK Gardening Classics YouTube channel to watch segments from previous hosts. Oklahoma Gardening is produced by the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University. The Botanic Garden at OSU is home to our studio gardens and we encourage you to come visit this beautiful Stillwater Jewel. We would like to thank our generous underwriter, the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry. Additional support is also provided by Pond Pro Shop, Greenleaf Nursery and the Garden Debut Plants, the Oklahoma Horticultural Society, and the Tulsa Garden Club. <laughs>